This morning's reading is from Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 44 through 53. Then he said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me by Moses and the prophets in the Psalms must all come true. Then he opened their minds to understand these many scriptures. And he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again from the dead on the third day. With my authority, take this message of repentance to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who turn to me. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send you the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. Then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to the heaven. They worshipped him, then returned to Jerusalem, filled with great joy, and they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God indeed. Thank you, Deb. We have Junior Church this morning. Last time Jolene was back there helping, she, uh, she said to me this morning, yeah, last time I got to take a break and go do Junior Church. <laughs> I didn't know she was on the clock, but there you go. At least we're giving breaks these days, right? <laughs> How was your week this week? Good? Bad? Busy? Yeah? Full? You ever get to that point where you say, all right, <sighs> next week, next week will be the week that I've got time, right? How many of you said that? Yeah, me too. How often does it happen? Not very often, because next week brings its own challenges and its own things, and that's life. And that's, that's up to us to decipher and try to choose what, what's happening, uh, how are we handling it, how are we dealing with it, and how's it going. And that's what hopefully those five things that we've been talking about all year are bringing us to. How is your surrender? Man, it's, it's first, it's always first, and it's always the hardest one, right? How do you let go? How do you do things and maybe I'm not supposed to do this, Right? How do we surrender? And then how are we surrounded? In other words, how are we bringing people into our life and, and bringing them around us to help us, to guide us, to be a guide to them and to be a helper to them? And then how are we spirit-led? See a little bit of that in today's text and even more next week's text, but how are we letting the Holy Spirit lead us? How are we then self-feeding? Are we grown up enough in our faith that we're ready for our own knife and fork and we eat on our own? And then how do we do all of that while being sent, sharing that gospel message with other people? Today's text tells us that Jesus lays that out, right? We're supposed to do that. That's a task. It's a thing. It's supposed to happen. Introvert or extrovert, doesn't matter. <laughs> Find a way. We've been going through this journey since Easter Sunday, and we've been talking a lot about preparing for the Holy Spirit. See, this time between Easter and Pentecost is, is meant to mimic the, the 40 days that Jesus was alive after being buried. And what it was that he did for people, teaching people, and being there in those 40 days. Today is the day that we celebrate the ascension. And what does that mean, the ascension? Well, it means that, that Jesus was here, he was in a physical form, and he would be taken up and, and just disappearing into the heavens because that's what he did. And in doing so was necessary so that we could then experience still God through the Holy Spirit that Jesus says today's text, I will send him back to you. You won't be alone. You will have this Holy Spirit power within you, God's Spirit. Jesus even goes so far in many places as to say, this will be greater than me being with you. 
I don't know about you, but I can imagine Jesus being here physically. That would be so much better. I could see him. I could touch him. But yet there would be a limit, though, as to how much he could help me. Now there's no limit. We don't often test that limit enough, but there's no limit to that. Oftentimes, if we want to test it, we would, we would be the, the genie in the lamp type of tester, wouldn't we? Right? Oh, yeah, God, if you're here, then your Holy Spirit's right here, then show up, right? Give me a physical sign. God's like, eh, I, don't, I don't do that anymore. I don't need a burning bush. The Holy Spirit's here right now. Like, you don't need that. In today's text, we get this piece of advice, this, this movement of God. And even though Jesus had spent so much time with these disciples and he talked to them and repeated himself over and over and over again, they're still left wondering, oh man, is this real? Is this the real deal? Is this really happening right now? Is this really God? Is Jesus really alive? I, I don't know. Jesus, I can imagine, is probably going, oh my gosh. How often do I have to tell this? Not only did I tell you the story over and over and over again, but now it's happened. I'm here and you still don't believe it. You're still struggling with that. I loved, uh, in my searching and, and finding, uh, Alan Quark uh, stated in his sermon, our, Jesus, our King Jesus Proves He's Alive. He says, when it comes to the importance of the resurrection, look to Paul. Because Paul pulls no punches. Now, if you know the story of Paul, you realize that he was once Saul of Tarsus. He murdered and imprisoned Christians, those who believed in Jesus, because he was a Pharisee of the highest order. And he was met by Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was blinded with a light and encountered that physical power. He encountered Jesus physically to a point he was convinced. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 and then 17 through 19, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And if only for this life... We have hope in Christ. We, of all people, are most to be pitied. No resurrection means no hope and no eternal life. So how can we, like those uh, first disciples, how can we be assured that Jesus is risen from the dead? How many of you have ever been confused? Yeah, maybe now it's one of those moments, right? Like, oh, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, this is weird. When uh, John Clark, uh, John W. Clark used this illustration in his book, A View from the Cross, and he was talking about a university student, and, and he was walking around, he had a t-shirt with the letter K on it, and, and he was approached by, uh, by somebody who said, hey, cool shirt, what's the K stand for? And he says, confused. Honest question, he says, well, you know that, that confused is not spelled with a K. And the kid said, you have no idea how confused I am. <laughs> That's kind of where we are in this faith process. Sometimes we're confused. We have this moment of trying to understand what a, a resurrected life looks like, and then why wouldn't Jesus just appear to all of us? What is the power of the Holy Spirit? Why did Holy Spirit have to come here and be with us? You're going to hear me probably say it without the the in front of it, because Holy Spirit is a person. Spirit of God, God's Spirit, Holy Spirit, it's, it's a person. We often say the Holy Spirit just because of gram grammatically how it sounds, but Holy Spirit is a person. And Holy Spirit came back and has this power and ability to be with all of us. And this is where the disciples were that day on the day of ascension. They knew the truth. 
They'd been there. They'd heard it. They'd done it over and over and over again. But in this moment, they're still experiencing doubt. Like, so did that really happen? Yeah. And Jesus is like, here, look. <laughs> here it is. Look, it happened. This really went down and I am really alive. And I love what he does in order to uh, unpack. And I, and I love that we went into Luke's gospel for this part of the message because of the way Luke changes the story. He kind of crams all of 40 days into one night, right? Jesus rose. Jesus then meets them and ascends to heaven. It's kind of weird, but we have, you know, proof that it was longer than, than 24 hours. In Luke's gospel, though, we see it happen right after uh, Cleopas and his, his friend, probably his wife, because that's who you would travel with in those moments. Cleopas and his wife show up, and they're like, we were with Jesus. We saw him. We ate dinner with him. We didn't even know it was him at first. They thought it was an actual person. And then Jesus appears in the room with them. And I love the way he addresses the problem, right? He addresses the elephant in the room, if you will. And he says, why are you frightened? Why are you scared? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me. Make sure that I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. It's kind of weird that Jesus is admitting that ghosts are real. Just drop that in there for you. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. They stood there and they're still in disbelief. What does Jesus do? Give me something to eat. I'm starving. Being dead is really hard. So he eats, he eats fish with them. He eats a piece of broiled fish with them. And all of this is to give them this comfort, this peace, this not be frightened. I'm with you. I'm real. This happened. And Jesus greets them with that, why are you frightened? Because you were dead, man. <laughs> we saw you buried. Of course, we're a little bit freaked out. And then he's like, but I'm here. It's okay. And I feel like what happens next is he's trying to prove it so he can set the stage for the next step, which is him to leave. And he promises that there's power in this, there's hope in this. And what he does is then he opened their mind to the scriptures. Wow. He let holy scriptures come alive. Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It also is written that his message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. Wow. Even from that very moment, Jesus is preparing those who believe in him for their task, for the work, to experience him risen. Now it must change their life, and now they're called to tell the world about him. And I love the, the NASB version uh, of verse 49 because of the way it words how the Spirit is to come to them. Uh, Jesus says, and behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. I'm sending the promise of God, the father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. I love that phrase because it talks about clothed, right? We've heard Paul use that, 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 that mental metaphor, the imagery before, clothed in righteousness, Paul says. Jesus is now saying, you will be clothed in power from on high. That's the spirit. Now, granted, the spirit's a person, so I don't know what it'd be like to put a person on like a coat. But I know that that's the attitude and that's the temper and that's what he's asking us. 
And see, Jesus needed to ascend to the Father after continuing to prove he was indeed alive so that we all could experience that power from on high that he's talking about. It's necessary. It's a necessary part of the experience so that Holy Spirit is a part of our life. And when we are seeing him and hearing him, it begins to change everything because that is Holy Spirit making that happen. Does it happen for everyone the same way all the time? Nope. How many of us can say, uh, in my life, uh, I have experienced times where I did not believe any of this? I got one. I got two, three. Oh, yeah, y'all over there, y'all just believe it all. Okay, cool. <laughs> From birth. Yeah, Jesus is real. Sweet. I haven't. As a kid who grew up in Sunday school class here, as a kid who uh, was here before you had the comfortable padding, the red padding, it used to just be wood. You know how hard that is to, when, when Pastor Jim or, or those guys would get long-winded, whoo, mm, make, the, make the hindquarters a little sore. But we did it because the Spirit of God was here and the Spirit of God was moved. But we have moments in our lives in which life becomes overwhelming and we move and we change and our hearts and our minds are not willing to accept that Holy Spirit, that clothing. We don't want to put it on anymore. I'm tired. I hurt. I don't understand. I'm confused. And yet there comes also a point in our life in which we put that clothing back on. We put that Holy Spirit back on us and we say to ourselves, it was right. It was right. All of those things that I learned and all of those things that I was taught, they were right. How do I put it back on? How do I re-engage in this? I've made such a mess of myself. I've done so many things. I've done this and I've done that. How do I put this back on? And it's pretty simple. Jesus loves us. Jesus forgives us. And he just calls us to just walk and put it back on. Just put it back on. What he calls us to is to experience the power like the disciples in which they understood at this very moment what was happening. Jesus was going to leave them. But better was coming. He promised it. And if he promised that he was going to die and yet live, and he's right, if he promised that he was going to heal the blind, make the lame walk, make Lazarus come back to life, then proves it himself that he's the Messiah, how could we not trust him? And next week when we see the Holy Spirit rush through the building, oh man. The only difference between us and those disciples that day is they were willing. They were willing to believe what they heard, see what they saw, and engage in it. Now in this moment, finally understanding who he really was, they're watching and they're celebrating as their Savior is leaving them. And they realize for a moment that it's their choice. It's going to be up to them. But in order for them to succeed, Jesus tells them that they have to wait. They have to wait on the spirit. They have to wait on the power. They have to wait on the guide. And as somebody who tried to do it on my own for at least 25 plus years and failed miserably, oh, you have to wait on the spirit. You have to trust him. You have to be willing to say, I believe you. And I know this sounds like it's going to be really hard, whatever it is he's asking you to do. It's going to be really hard. It's really confusing. And I really don't know what I'm doing, but I trust you. And when you step into that, when you clothe yourself with that power, oh, it's different. It's different and it changes things in your life. It changes the way it works. It changes what you see. It changes everything around you. Let me ask you a question. Have you seen him this morning? 
Did you shake somebody's hand and say hi and you're like, what is that? Did you remember something that you were supposed to do for somebody today and go, yeah, there he is. That's the way the spirit works and that's the way the spirit shows up for other people through you. That is what he's doing within us, around us. And sometimes this takes a period of waiting. Sometimes it takes a long period of waiting. And sometimes it takes us to be longing for nothing but that spirit. It takes waiting, listening, and quieting the world around us to understand. Yep, he is absolutely the God that he promises that he is. Amen. Join me.